you know, this is kind of a new trend, like kakata poitanga or queerness is, is some kind of new, um, you know, an emergence is, is, you know, completely slammed with this this enormous anthology of, you know, look at us, we're here, we've been speaking for, for ages. And yeah, I, I think the the quality in the spectrum really speaks to that, to the way in which queerness can be represented in so many different ways it's and in ways that you probably don't expect. It's interesting in the introduction too that... Um editors saying that they changed direction somewhat in, in, in what they were planning as the submissions um, came in and they were quite overwhelmed yeah. also by the response. Exactly, exactly, yeah. I think that that introduction also speaks to the way in which queerness is represented in, in so many different ways. It doesn't have to explicitly mention, you know, the, the queerness of, because the, the identity of the writer carries that, you know, that, that whole queerness in itself. So, yeah, I think once they opened up the submissions, they just saw that it was queer writers writing about their lives. And so that, you know, that brings in a whole whole litany of stuff that they can publish. And it's it's a beautiful read. Wonderful. Thank you. Kia ora. Michelle Rahirahu has reviewed Out Here, an anthology of takatapui and LGBTQIA plus writers from Aotearoa. It is edited by... Emma Barnes and Chris Teese, published by Auckland University Press, $50 for a hardback. And there are some uh, Sarah Lang uh, cartoons in there as uh, well, um, in in the uh, book as well. As we said, just about every genre is covered. Nearly a quarter to 11, we'll get in a moment to the reading for you, the next episode of our story. Uh, but just a reminder that on the web page, as often we have a gallery of images accompanying many of our stories, including the interview we just have with John Guy on that fascinating story, the discovery, his discovery of a letter, or certainly recognising the significance of a letter that gave real insight into the relationship between Elizabeth I and Mary, Queen of Scots, right at the critical time, just ahead of Mary's ultimate execution and the betrayal, not by her cousin, but by her own son that ultimately sent her to her execution, it appears. So do have a look at those images and make the most of the content on the website. Of course, you can also use it to share audio uh, with others. And there's often links through to information, further information about our story. So do make the most of it. The team puts a tremendous amount of effort into preparing it. Parenting today is Saab Johal, and we're talking about the loneliness that parenting can involve, and particularly during events like a pandemic we'll be getting his thoughts and of course he's always happy to take your questions or your observations 9 to noon at rnz.co.nz text them to 2101 or tweet them at 9 to noon now episode 9 of Dog Side Story by Patricia Grace in the previous episode Roa and the sisters battled for the custody of Kid and the village thrives with the millennium guests it was a long two weeks There was all that was going on in the planned game, as well as the drama going on round the sidelines. Host energies were stretched, especially as after the first week their numbers dwindled. And among all of this, Babs and Amelia hadn't lost sight of other important matters which they were waiting to hear from their lawyer about. So, Kath Wyman said, Unless there's anything further that you think might strengthen your case, I wouldn't advise that you continue. You'd be much better off with an out-of-court agreement. This treacherous lawyer in whom they'd put their trust. Abandoned. Again. What do you mean by anything further? Amelia asked. It would have to be evidence of neglect on the part of the father or something serious to do with the father's behaviour. Doubt about his suitability. Skeletons in closets, Kath said. Well, if it was neglect that she wanted to know about, bad behaviour she was interested in, or suitability, skeletons in closets, the two knew they could come up with plenty. Plenty, if they put their minds to it. Kid. Now, here was Hickey Norman on the phone, saying he needed to see him urgently. Something's come up. Bring a couple of the aunties or uncles, he said. Well, can't be that bad. Bring them, he said. What I've got here, 
Heke Norman said, is notes from a media and Babs lawyer regarding what the two are saying. They're now putting less emphasis on who has the right to be Kitty's main caregiver and are concentrating on suitability. In other words, they want to bring a case that will show what they believe is Rua's unsuitability to be a father. We'll take those two first. They're alleging, firstly, that Rua here is a user and an addict. That, secondly, he and his cousins have a marijuana plantation up the back somewhere and a part of a drug ring. They don't seem to have any evidence apart from the fact that they say they've seen nieces and nephews, not Rua, coming down from the hills where Rua's house is with implements. I mean... All I need to know is they're not going to come up with a list of convictions or a bunch of evidence. It's a load of rubbish, Y said. Not true then? No convictions? None, he said. You drink? Yep, same as them. OK, it's just we don't want any surprises. <sighs> Let's see. Well, the land business. So? So what are they saying? saying your only interest in having Kitty is so you can steal land. That's as far as they'd go. No evidence, nothing to support. Mad in the head, them. Rua here's got his own land, Y said. Clear title to some. She is in other places. He don't need land. And the girl got nothing yet, Tinny said, except what she got coming later like anyone else. Have you had any land dealings? Hickey Norman asked. None. Like they say, I've got my own. All right, look, I reckon we can deal with all that. They certainly don't seem to have much support for any of those things they're saying. But, Ekwi, fire? Yeah, there's more. To do with, well, to do with what they're calling the abduction. And they're giving their own version for the reasons for the so-called abduction. And? Well, let's come to that. Equi, fire? What they're alleging is to do with Rua's relationships. First with the mother of Kitty, then with Kitty herself. Putting it clearly, they're alleging Rua here had an incestuous relationship with the girl's mother, the mother of Kitty being his sister. Evil. Rua here and the mother of Kitty have the same mother. Y said. So that's true. They're brother and sister. But there's no way, no way those two are going to put that round any court. It's family business. More important may be the rest of it, he said. What rest of it? They say they saw New Year's morning. They're saying and saying others saw. He had to think back to the night and day of so many happenings. Nutters, he said. What they're talking about is me asleep on my bed up at the old place. Kid asleep on the same bed too. Nuts. Poison. The sooner we get home, take a piece out of those two, the better. Knowing their big mouths, they could be spouting this all round the place already. It could have crossed the inlet by now. Why was right to be concerned? Tongues were going for it over the bridge at the post shop. When customers or casual callers first noticed the absence of Kitty and asked after her, they received abrupt replies from Babs, who said she had gone to the hospital with a burn on her arm and that her uncle had taken her to Wellington without their permission while he was off getting himself a new leg. So, what was revealed to Y, Tinny and Rua when they went to their meeting with Heke Norman many weeks into the new year, was already hot on God's side. It had all crossed water via the bridge, via the footpaths and stores, via post shop and bay fish. Kid. Kid asleep. He could pick her up and go, but it was only a thought. It was two weeks after they'd all gone to talk to Amelia and Babs that the big four had walked in on him and asked him to change his mind about going to court. Tinny had been unable to persuade Amelia and Babs and now they had come to ask him to give up his daughter, just in the meantime, and they'd see to it she was treated all right. 
In a few more years, she'd be able to make up her own mind and come to him of her own accord, they believed. No way, he told them. I'm not leaving her, not giving her up. Bad time. They had it in for him and he didn't know why. Worst time of his life. Heke had asked him to name witnesses, anyone at all who could back up any of the statements he'd made, anyone at all who would give a character reference. One or two from outside the family would be good, he'd said. Give me contact numbers. So he'd given Heke Miner's number, but so far, even though Heke had left messages for her more than a week ago, she hadn't called in to see him. Nothing from her. And it seemed that no matter what information he gave, and even if he agreed to the examination, Heke was unable to tell how the case would go. The door opened. Jace came in and switching the light on. Bad, he said. What they been blabbing, those two? Bones came in behind Jace, carrying the baby who was asleep, followed by Ramelda. I should pick her up and get out, take off for Oz, he said knowing he never would. Anyhow, they can't take her. You're her father, that's it, Bones said. His cousins and Ramelda moved in and settled themselves, Jace taking up the guitar and picking at it. The door opened again and Eva came in. Need putting out of their misery, those two, she said. And as for these so-called co Matua, Nan, Uncle Larch, Nan Tinney, what they on about? Dodgy them. You don't know which way they're facing. Say they support you same time as they want you to give up your daughter. Give up on me, you think? Seems like. Them and Miner too, he said. And just then Miner came in. <laughs> All having a tonguey here, Eva said. Join the party. What's going on, she said. What's all this shit flying round all over the place? Look, Eva, go and get Nan, Arch and Tinny if she's around. I got something to say. I didn't get to answering Hickey Norman's message until today. What's going on? What sort of a whānau is this? Is this supposed to be a family or what? Hickey Norman went through the lot, she said. Oh, I couldn't but be- I've come to get him. If they're telling him to give up his daughter, as if he's done wrong. I'm taking him with me, taking his daughter with me, if they'll come, for as long as he needs, or as long as he wants, if he'll come. Now Miner had walked in and caused a walk out. Why Arch and Tinny were jolted, all three lay awake the night they heard and on many nights afterwards. Tinny, Y and Arch were upset at first that blame had been dumped on them, on what was seen as their lack of action, their lack of support. If there was fault on their part, if there was blame due to them, it was for what had happened ten years earlier. What they were trying their best to do now was some kind of damage control, wanting to protect people from the venom of tongues, protect the family... Maybe they could have done more about the present situation if there'd been more time, but with the court coming up, they knew there was no time and believed they'd done the best they could under the circumstances. What more could be expected of them? Experience had shown them that matters righted themselves given time, and if you didn't jiggle them too much, could they just wait and see? In time, Kid would leave her aunties and go to Rua of her own accord. In time, the young ones who had left would come home. But they all knew there was no time if they were going to see all this with their living eyes. Also, they were afraid there'd be too much fallout from playing the waiting game and none of them wanted to leave a mess behind. Another alternative was to just forget it, let it all go to heck. They could sit and watch television, go la-la like Pop Henry, match their footsteps into his, even though they knew the old man was well ahead of them on that particular path. If they chose to forget, the tide would still come in and go out twice a day. These were tired thoughts, however, and in the end they had to admit there was something not right that had to be put right, 
and that it was up to them to do it. They couldn't allow themselves to sleep, die or go gaga until they'd given it their best shot. Besides, there were other consequences as well if it wasn't sorted. For example, there was a dining room to build. All the materials had arrived, but now there was no workforce, or only a small and disabled workforce to build it. Blocks and timber, bags of cement, stones and piles, and silence. There was only so much that those with frailty and crook internals could do, though they might carry blocks and mix cement up to a point. There was only a certain amount that mothers with babies could do, and though there were others, young and more able-bodied, who had said they could spend weekends working, once they found out what had happened, they had become disinclined. These ones wanted everything sorted first. The big question that everyone was asking was, what was the use of having a kitchen and dining facility if the houses were all emptying out, leaving no one behind the pots, no one catching fish, collecting watercress, no one to help put the hangi down? For that matter, what was the use of the whare nui itself if there was to be no family, if there were to be no speakers, no one to call the people home? No one to look after the visitors or to retell the stories. No one under the beams to create the updrafts and downdrafts. Where would be breathing? Okay. Tinny, Arch and Y had to pick themselves up out of tired thoughts and find a way. In order to do that, they had to seek inside themselves and remember who they were. What they remembered was that if you came down to bone there was always the matter of survival, which had all been done before, of oceans, of war, of illness, of theft and starvation. Compared to all that, this was nothing. Only a bit of yak-yak that had been stopping them from seeing. After all, they were not caught. They were bone, and they'd allowed themselves to be bullied. There had to be a hui, And that was the latest episode in Dogside Story by Patricia Grace. The reader was Waimihi Hotari. Dogside Story was engineered by Phil Benge and produced by Hone Koka. Another episode tomorrow at a quarter to 11 on 9 to noon. In the next hour, we begin with Tony Grasso, our tech correspondent, looking at some more of the hacks that are continuing to hit companies and often the contractors that companies use, the latest big one at the moment is Frontier Software. Saab Johal is our parenting commentator today and he's focusing on the loneliness of parenting at times and particularly at times like a pandemic. So we will hear his ideas on this and some research on it but as always happy to take your observations and questions. And before midday also Lomato Loano, who we hear with what she has been viewing. Still to come on 9 to noon on RNZ National. RNZ News at 11. Good morning. I'm Nicola Wright. A man has tested positive for COVID-19 in Palmerston North after he started feeling unwell yesterday. The man is a casual contact of one of the two cases found in the Tararua town of Woodville at the weekend. Manawatu Cricket Association chairperson Carla Nanakorn says the man was at a club training on Tuesday evening. The player who tested positive last night had a COVID test on Monday morning, which returned a negative result. So he went to training, club training on Tuesday night at the MCA facility on Park Road. Then yesterday, Wednesday morning, he woke feeling unwell. So he went and had another COVID test and that one came back positive. The Cricket Association's Palmerston North training facility will have a deep clean today. All its staff are fully vaccinated, but it has cancelled school visits for the rest of the week. A COVID-19 modeller expects the number of cases to ramp up once schools go back next year. 
University of Canterbury professor Michael Plank says the easing of Auckland travel restrictions next month means cases will start to spread. But he's expecting the worst to come in the new year. Back to school will be a crunch point. That's still some time away uh, and there's a lot could happen between now and then. You know, And it re- really remains to be seen how it plays out as the virus spreads ar- around the country. But certainly going into cooler weather, that's when we're likely to see case numbers um, start to, to accelerate again. Michael Plank says it would have been better to wait until each DHB reaches the 90% vaccination goal before moving to the traffic light system. An urban planner is worried proposed law changes that will ramp up housing intensification will simply lead to more development on the periphery of cities. The bill, which has bipartisan support, would allow three houses up to three storeys high to be built on one section. But Auckland-based Sentinel Planning Managing Director Simon O'Connor told Nine to Noon that would apply right across the city, even in areas where there is not the infrastructure to support that growth. Developers are looking at this going, this is, this is Christmas, this is get out champagne, there are so many options here for them to bring things forward, but it's not, it's not a good outcome for you know, quality, quality environment that we want to live in. Simon O'Connor says encouraging greater housing intensification is good, but he's concerned the bill will have haphazard consequences. The top family court judge has told a law conference there's a good reason to be optimistic about the court's future. Judge Jackie Moran marked the family court's 40th anniversary at a law society event at Te Papa this morning. She told the gathering the court may be heavily burdened, but she categorically rejects that it is biased or broken. Judge Moran asked the law profession not to shy away from asking hard questions. She says the family court had no wairua or soul when it was established in 1981, but its modern form does. The Independent Police Conduct Authority says a Whanganui shift supervisor made an error of judgment in cutting the undergarment straps of a woman in custody. However, its report found the search and subsequent arrest of the woman for committing an indecent act in September last year was justified. She was searched at the Whanganui police station and, due to concerns for her mental health, was asked to put on a tear-proof gown. The woman failed to comply and was assisted by officers. She complained about her treatment, including the way she was searched, the removal of her clothing and the decision to charge her. The United States is planning to invest billions of dollars to expand a supply of COVID-19 vaccines to poor countries. Health experts say global vaccine inequity is one of the main reasons the pandemic continues. Our correspondent Rachel Silverman reports. The White House says it's made a plan for the U.S. to produce at least one billion doses of the coronavirus vaccine a year. Top advisors to President Biden say beginning in the second half of 2022, the U.S. will invest billions of dollars expanding manufacturing with a view to supplying the domestic market and other less developed countries. It's part of a wider public-private partnership to guard against COVID variants and future pandemics. State Highway 1 north of Wellington has reopened after a fatal crash, but there are still long queues. All northbound lanes and one southbound between Tawa and Porirua were shut after the early morning crash. The transport agency Waka Kotahi says there are still significant delays going north and drivers should take alternative routes on State Highways 2 and 58. That's the news. Saturday nights on RNZ National are all about the music. Another Saturday night. Everything is going to be right Cause it's Saturday night Down at the Hope On a Saturday night Down, down at the Hope On a Saturday night Cause it's all on Saturday night Five hours of your requests Every Saturday night from 7 on RNZ National Now the forecast from Met Service through to midnight tomorrow Bay of Plenty, Taupo and Taihape also, Gisborne, Hawke's Bay and Wairarapa, generally fine. However, a few afternoon and evening showers both today and tomorrow, and some may be heavy with thunderstorms. Now, in the western North Island, from Northland to Wellington, also for Coromandel Peninsula and Taumarunui, fine, some cloud at times. Isolated showers this afternoon for Northland. For Nelson, Marlborough, Canterbury and Otago, it's mainly fine. Isolated showers inland this afternoon could be thundery in Marlborough. Oh, look, this is a, another chance to come and visit with the local team on the ground who are doing amazing work on vaccinations, just to say thank you um, and to also just say keep going. You know, here in this region, 
uh, at 84% first doses, uh, they're actually only 2,500 doses away from hitting that 90% target, uh, which we know is so important for all our communities to be better protected. At these vaccination levels... At the moment here. Are, are you confident events like Ribbon Blinds will be able to go ahead and safe there? Yeah, so this is, still kind of weighing that up? We are still driving for very high rates of vaccination yeah. because it gives that extra layer of protection for all our communities. I know here in this region there are big events over the summer that they are wanting to host. Uh, two things that will be important there. First, we are providing support for some of those big events to be able to hang on a little longer before they have to make decisions around the go-ahead. But secondly, we see huge effort here on the ground, driving vaccinations so that it can be possible. And I believe Tight Afferty can do it. Have you got any feedback on how people here are feeling about the borders opening with Auckland and people moving out over summer? Yeah. Look, we know that there will be concern about movement, which is why we've put in extra layers of protection. There is an expectation, a requirement, that Aucklanders who, when departing, will need to be um, either vaccinated or testing tested before they depart. Of course, the other protection is moving into the new framework, which we will do in advance of those changes uh, in Auckland because we also know that adds extra protection. But ultimately, ultimately, Auckland have done uh, a very important job for us, but they will have by that time done that for almost four months. We do need to keep moving, but we will keep moving as safely as possible. You already heard a few weeks ago. Um, why have you come back? Is it too slow for your life? Oh, no, this, as I've said, uh, not at all. In fact, we're seeing it pick up, we're seeing, you know, really pick up the pace across the board, but including in, the, in this region. Uh, I'm back here again because this is one of the regions where the work that's being done is just so important to us. And I think it's timely, you know, here at this critical point to come and say thanks and mm. to give greater encouragement. To, to be realistic, though, a red light does loom over tight after to some of us now. Oh, look, at this stage, Yes, we would expect um, that if we were still at these rates on the 29th of November when we come to make those decisions, then yes, those areas that you know are well under the 90, then yes, we would consider moving into red. But uh, we have seen things move very quickly. Mm -hmm. And as I say, 2,500 doses is not much to considerably lift that extra layer of protection for people. Have you people. got anything else up your sleeve as we get to sort of the real pointy end of the rollout? Is there anything else that you could throw at this to get the rates up, sort of national incentives or no, anything else? In no one case? knows better um, mm -hmm. than community on the ground about what is yep. going to make a difference. And so the most important we thing we can do is to empower and support local communities to run their vaccination campaigns. What we can do nationally, though, is point out that actually if you want to enjoy summer, then you will need to have that vaccine pass. Uh, and now having released that vaccine pass yesterday, I think people are seeing how important vaccination will be for them to continue to enjoy all the things they love. So would you rule out sort of national incentive efforts? There are incentives running mm -hmm. up and down the country. Mm -hmm. There are incentives right here in this mm -hmm. region, but this, is the, this community will know best the things that will make a difference to their vaccination rollout. I might just give a chance to the, our local members of parliament to say a word on that because they've been really highly involved. <laughs> yeah, sure thing, boss. Look, the people that you see here in this room, uh, these are our, they're our superheroes. You know, they're out there every single day. They're up at the crack of dawn, 5 a.m., pushing right through to, you know, 11, 12, right into the night, and I get text messages from them at all hours. So these people here who are intimately connected in our communities they're going to be the ones that can provide the solutions for our whānau. We've seen over the last three weeks a huge big pickup in our numbers. That's because of the efforts of whānau like this. We've been able to provide wraparound support from central government through Minister Hinare's uh, funding through to local providers. So we're really confident in our people here. We're confident in the knowledge that they have. And our job is to wrap around and provide support. But here on the East Coast, there wasn't a single uh, Super Saturday event. They had fundraise for their own VAX bus. Were you doing enough as the local MP in Cabinet to advocate for the providers? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. No. Look, I... Absolutely. Our people here, so Super Saturday actually was pretty, pretty successful on all accounts for the East Coast. Uh, there were about 900 people that were vaccinated that day. Uh, the week prior, there were events up and down the East Coast. Actually, the Prime Minister had been up in uh, Ruatoria looking at some horses and up at the rugby game just the Saturday before it, with the vaccination buses. There are four mobile units that are all uh, action stations all go up the East Coast, and there's been mobile stations the entire way through. 
Whether people needed to fundraise for those things, well, you know, community groups can do what they want, but the funding has always been here from central government to support local-led initiatives. Now, these are the warriors that are on the front line. They've been doing the mahi, and they'll make the decisions about where best to locate those resources, and I trust their judgment. But I've spoken to someone who is whānau in the Ruatoria who's very frustrated that their clinic was only open for two hours a week, and it wasn't on the day that most people come into town There's... to do their grocery shopping. So there wasn't that connect between what people needed in the communities and what was being... And so just to, just to point out again that even before Super Saturday, when I was last here on the coast... Uh, I was in Ruatoria with a mobile unit, right. uh, and that was not the first event that had been held in Ruatoria. And the places that we were were at rugby games and places where people are going to happen to be. They might not have planned to be vaccinated, but that's the kind of places that we want to link into people. That is not the only opportunity. For those more remote areas, we need to make sure that we are coming in on a regular basis. That's exactly what we're seeing on the East Coast for those remote places. Look, for those who did put up um, those fundraising calls, that then turned into an opportunity for us to say, hey, we have resource. That is not in question here. What areas do you want us to be reaching into and how can we work together? And that is exactly what happened in that case. Okay, I'll just span around. Yeah, talking about this number, 2,500 to get to 2,588. To get to first doses. On the Ministry of Health vaccination numbers... For the Kaidaka CCHB, for Māori to get to first dose is 90%, it's around 2,500. So why is it that Māori make up the last ones to get to... Look, we've seen across the country that we have had, in terms of our general population numbers, a distance between where we are there on um, first doses versus Māori. Um, but we are seeing that gap close. Uh, we saw it close first for our older population. So there... Our older people, between Māori and the rest of the population, pretty much on par. Now we need to do the same with the rest of the population. That hard work now is really going to need and continue to go into particularly our young people. Why would they last, though? Do you, do you think that you have left Māori behind? I absolutely stand by the decisions that we made right at the beginning of the campaign to protect those who, if they had COVID, would be more likely to die. And unfortunately, of course, we know that is our older people. Mm -hmm. But you can see now in our statistics and our numbers that that is the reason we have such high vaccination rates amongst our older people. Yes, now the job is to move our young people, and we are doing everything it takes to try and make sure that they are vaccinated. Do you believe that the government's handling of the outbreak has been a breach of the weapon? No, I don't. You know, it, that our elimination strategy, which has served us so well, was uh, chosen by us as a strategy because we knew uh, that COVID, when you don't have vaccines and when you don't have medicines to treat it, posed a huge risk to New Zealand and its population. Now we have other tools to keep us safe, but we're still, even with a vaccine, adding extra layers of protection to do all we can to look after people. But the Deputy Prime Minister yeah. this afternoon thing is yet heading up to Auckland to meet yes. with businesses. And, and you've been up to Auckland and other yeah. places meeting with businesses. Yeah. What sort of feeling do you get from them? A lot of them have been doing it really tough they for have. a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is it do you sense that there's sort of growing despair? Or no, I, I mean, I actually met, um, I met virtually uh, yesterday with some of our key business leaders um, in Auckland, uh, and that's been something we've been consistently uh, doing throughout the outbreak. And the sense I get now is, of course, they can, they can see uh, the, that where we are heading, they can see the light, as it were, because things are changing. We are moving. Uh, the boundary announcement was one key decision. Uh, they're looking now to the flip into the new COVID protection framework. And of course, we had schools back this week. All of that demonstrates that we are moving as safely as we can. Can I ask you about vaccine mandates for police? Yeah, oh, and then I'll just finish up, I think, with the last two. Yeah, yeah go vaccine ahead. Vaccine mandates for police. Yep. Uh, do you support that? Andrew Foster said this morning that you're talking to the federal government. Yeah, about. yes, and look, we've had uh, the police commissioner make very strong representations on the half of the police asking for mandates. Very high rates of vaccination in the police, you know, 88% first, um, first dose, uh, and not a concern there that we have a significant issue uh, with police being vaccinated, but they do want that extra requirement. Uh, Cabinet will con consider that alongside some of the other uh, vaccination work we're doing and uh, uh, give a final decision in due well, course. Well, when they're going out, you know, places doing spot checks, they want to be assured that they'll be safe and they're actually dealing with other vaccine policemen or police officers. Uh, yeah, and look... A number already were required as part of our requirements uh, for those working in 
our border facilities. And so a number of frontline officers you'll already find are on top of that. You'll see that they do wear very high-grade PPE. Um, they are in N95 masks for that extra layer of protection, but the police are seeking mandates and Cabinet are giving it consideration. I'll on finish with the, you, Amelia. Thank you. On the concerns of the more advanced regions, are spot checks going to be enough to, make, to protect them? And when you come to make the decision on November 29th, could we actually see some hard borders around some of the lower vaccinated regions? So there are two things I'd say. Yes, the, what the requirement we've put on Auckland is to be vaccinated or tested before departure is one layer of protection. The second is vaccination across the country. So you see that we've made the decision to keep it until the 15th of December before we make those changes so that we can keep driving vaccinations. The third layer is the new COVID protection framework. So for those Aucklanders who may be moving around the country who are required to be tested, if they are not vaccinated, there are limited things that they are able to engage with in the rest of the country because of that new system and the vaccine pass. The final thing I'd say is we are working with Northland on what the checks will look like going into the north because we do know that is an area where currently we have 83% first dose there, uh, a lower than we would like, which is why we'll have extra checks. So there could be hard borders around some of the more... We're allowing the police... Uh, so we're allowing the police here, specifically we think we're working on Northland. We're allowing the police to work with the local community and iwi so that we can balance the checks but also make sure that people are able to move. And what about here in Tairafti? What can we see sort of for two? protect this region? Again, the best thing we can do to protect the whole country is vaccines. Yeah. You know, uh, we, we cannot rely on borders in a country like ours that is so mobile. We will keep using them in a way to slow the spread. They've been so helpful to date. But with high vaccination rates, um, with the COVID protection framework, we do believe we can safely move back to being able to move around the country again. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Everyone waiting. Kaore mā te tangata ke, hoino ko te pūtea hei tautoko ake i ngā mahi a ngā ringa raupā kua kitea i te rāne. Ngari e mohi ona tātou, ko, te, ko ngā mahi a kanuhi nei, ka tō tōia mai te Māori ki tēnei kaupaka. Ai, ka piki ake ngā te tauranga mo te hunga Māori ka whakawhiwhia ki te kano a rai mate. Engari i huitahi mātou i te ata nei ko te ki a ngā rangatira o tēnei rohe. Ka pēhea mātou hei tautoko ake ngā mahi whakapakari i te tia ki whānau ki roto i tēnei wahe. Uh, hore kau he maharahara, i tēnei wātonu kua kite atu e piki haere ana ngā ta tauranga. Ki tāku e whakapai nei, ka tu tuki hia uh, i mua mai o te wahi o te krihi mete. Engari, ka tiro atu ki au anō ki roto i te tai tokerau e āhua tō muri ana. Nō reira koina te kia te primia uh, ki a whakarite hia i ngā mahi kaupare ki te raki o tāma ki makaurau. Ah, oh, no, um, katau toko. <laughs> Kare he raru, uh, ko kite atu i au e huri haere ana e hui tahi ana ki ngā iwi, e tino hari koa ana ngā iwi, i ngā mahi tau toko a te kāwanatanga ki ngā tūwhainga o te wānei. Engari, ko te hia hia, kia pē rātonu mō ake, kaua mō tēnei kaupapa anake. Uh, look, um, every tribe I've met with as I've gone around the country have actually been quite supportive of the work that we've been doing uh, as a government to support the work that they want to do in their community. My hope and, uh, is that that will continue well beyond the vaccination. And of course we see that happening with the Māori Health Authority and other spaces. Uh, 
if I can see that there's, so there were real, a lot of warning signs about that the most remote regions in New Zealand were going to be among the most safe. Everyone saw that coming. Did you do enough of that cabinet to make sure that the providers got the resources they needed to be enough? 110%. And the reason I say that is, at the start of the vaccination process, you had to store it at minus 70. You couldn't do that in Ruatoria. You could only do that centrally. That's why it took some time to get the infrastructure to become mobile and to be able to take these vaccines to where the people are. They were doing that back in July. They were doing that months ago. Pardon, sorry? They were doing that back in July. Months ago, they were doing that. Oh, they're exactly. And same with Tai Tokero. Well, no, the work's got to be done with our people. I mean, taking the service to Ruatoria is the first step. Actually, the biggest step is working with our families to make sure they can feel comfortable to engage, and that's what we rely on these people for. One of the barriers that they have with those buses is that they have to pre-book um, vaccination so that they can get the vials to go up. There's no spontaneity about it. They have to organise it before they go up. What else can be done there to help speed that up to make sure that they are doing hands, they get everything they need? to get as many people vaccinated? Well, the reason for the booking was because it had to be stored at a certain temperature. If it was taken out of that, it would begin to expire. That's why the booking. But now we know that you can actually have quite a length of time while it's out of the freezer to be able to make sure we can vaccinate our people. The challenge, of course, is getting them up there. And I'm confident we've done that. We've done that in Taitokere. I've seen it myself since I came up here in April. Last weekend, they had to make bookings to get vaccinated by this bus. Why, why is that still happening? Well, that's because you've got to be able to take them from here up the coast. That's three hours to some of those places. So we've got to have a, have a signal for how much demand is there at the moment. Now, let's be very clear in Māori communities like this. It isn't about the event. It's about the work that leads up to it. So if we can engage our whānau, we'll know the numbers that we need to take up the coast. We can match that. And I shouldn't say that incentives could actually shift some of the people who want, who are probably going to get it at some point, but it could speed up that process. Would you like to see more incentives rolled out in the publicity of the incentives? You know, hundred dollar petrol voucher to cover the petrol to come in to get your vaccination, etc. I was in Teteko two days ago and they're giving out petrol vouchers and food vouchers. It's already happening, and I'm confident that we'll get there. Is it being publicised enough? Oh, most definitely. Look, it doesn't have to be on one news or three news. Uh, what it has to be is locally, and I stood there with two Meke FM, the local health provider, giving out petrol vouchers to our whanau. And what, what, what are some of the other initiatives that have, that $120 million fund have gone to? Can you talk through some of the projects that have now had that backing? Yeah, look, um, we'll see into Tairawhiti, and you heard it today, uh, that there are multiple ways to our families' hearts, and two of those key ways are sports and kapahaka. And in an agreement that we have with this rohe to be able to deliver that, they'll do it through sports and kapahaka. Now, generally you wouldn't associate vaccination with sports and kapahaka, but here they've got all the ingredients for the best tasting cake. So, so how does that, that, that fund help that sort of roll out? Well, because in order to arrange an event of kapahaka or sports events, that money is important to make sure they've got the resources, they're able to promote it, and then secondly come in and attach the vaccination event. Thank you. Hey, what about 5 Friday? <laughs> Tell me what about that. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah.